Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word and we pray now that you would speak powerfully through it, your spirit would give us eyes to see and ears to hear as we reflect on your word and seek to apply it to our lives today. This we ask in Jesus' name, Amen. We're going to spend the next three weeks uh, taking a look at uh, the book of Isaiah and some of the things that it promised about the coming of the King, of course, appropriate to do in this season of Advent, where we prepare for the return of Christ as we get ready to remember His first coming at Christmas. And so, uh, from today, we have this poem from Isaiah 35, a prophetic poem of joy, joy for the redeemed. And as we come to that in a moment, let me first turn your mind uh, to Chile. Anyone been to Chile? I think Claire's been to Chile. Yeah, there you go. Uh, And uh, there's a place in Chile... Let's hope the internet's correct, because I could be fact-checked here. Uh, There's a place in Chile called the uh, Atacama Desert. Yes, she's nodding. Uh, And uh, this place is a place that if you ever get to Chile, you should go and visit, uh, because it is the driest place on earth. And I think I've got a picture uh, here on the screens for you. Uh, Apparently, it receives about 0.0004 inches of rainfall every year. No wonder the ground looks like that. And it spans over 41,000 miles, which I should have definitely converted to kilometres, but I didn't, and I can't on on the run, uh, and uh, is uh, 8,000 feet above sea level. Now, the interesting thing about this desert is that five years ago, in 2015, it rained a lot. Uh, It was actually quite bad for Chile, there was uh, significant flooding, but for the Atacama Desert, this dry, desolate place, these rare uh, and, and large winter rains turned this parched landscape into a, a nourishing, uh, wonderful, flowering, sort of beautiful place. And I've got a picture uh, of that, and it's worth having a look at some of the pictures of the Atacama Desert in bloom. It, uh, when the rain came, it, it nourished all these dry seeds that had just been kind of hibernating in the, in the, in the sand, in the 0.004 inches of rainfall each year, just waiting for the day that the life-giving water would flow upon them. And when it came, uh, out came this life. And it wasn't just flowers, but Uh, Lots of other species, rodents, lizards, birds, various insects, all were drawn into this desert, now full of of nourishing life. And they reckon they counted some 200 plant species that appeared uh, during this time as the desert was uh, brought to life with water. Well, that real-life story is a picture of Isaiah 35, 1 to 10. Uh, As you heard Diane read it, I hope you heard the the story of the desert turning to bloom, of the weak becoming strong, of God's people uh, moving from death to life, of of them being restored. Uh, And with their restoration comes the joy of being with God forever, of no more sorrow, of of having their, their, their lives watered with life. Isaiah 35:10 The Lord has rescued and the Lord and those the Lord has rescued will return they will enter Zion with singing everlasting joy will crown their heads gladness and joy will overtake them and sorrow and sighing will flee away what a wonderful picture this is of this future time and we'll come to that in a moment but before we do Uh, as we're going to take a look at a few different uh, uh, prophetic uh, chapters in Isaiah over the next few weeks, let's just take a moment to reflect on the book itself. Uh, It's a long book, uh, it's a great book, uh, and one commentator by the name of Oswald describes it as like this. He says, there is no other book in either the Old or New Testament, which comprehends the whole of biblical theology so completely as does Isaiah. He says, 
in this book and its chapters, uh, you get a really good picture of what God is doing, what God has done, and what God will do as the whole of the Bible sees it. Uh, And uh, we know, obviously, that Isaiah was written by the prophet Isaiah, and we know as well that it was written to warn God's people of their need to trust God and to to show them uh, the future that would come uh, if they continued to trust in Him. And our particular uh, passage today in uh, chapter 35 forms part of a, a larger chunk from chapter 7 through 39, where uh, Isaiah is calling on Israel again and again and again to choose to trust God instead of man, to choose to trust God for their salvation and their security instead of what was quite tempting to them at the time, to look around to the other nations, the bigger and the more powerful nations around them, and, and to trust in them for their safety, security and salvation. And the prophet says, no, no, trust in God. Trust in God, because that's how the desert becomes flourishing. And uh, for us today, as we consider Isaiah 35, we also need to consider the chapter that comes right before it, 34, because really they, they, they go together. Uh, chapter 34 and chapter 35 sum up this choice that, we're, that the, the prophet is presenting between trusting in God and its fruits that we've heard about in, uh, as we had chapter 35 read to us, and, and chapter 34, I encourage you to go home and, and read it or have a look at it now uh, on, in your Bible or on your phone. See, in chapter 34, Edom goes, uh, which is a, 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 a town, goes from luxury to wasteland. Whereas in chapter 35, we read of the wasteland, the desert, turning into a garden. And as, as you look at both chapters, there are all sorts of parallels like that. We read in chapter 34, verse 13, that the jackals uh, live in the desolate places. Whereas in chapter 35, verse 7, we read that there are no jackals in the fertile land, dangerous animals. We read of polluted streams in, verse, uh, in chapter 34, verse 9, versus the pure streams of Isaiah 35, verses 6 and 7. We read how there's no one passing through the land in Isaiah 34, verse 10, versus a highway in, verse, in chapter 35, verse 8. Uh, and we read of how it's God's judgment in chapter 34 that leads to this desert or this desolate land where there is no people and polluted streams and wild animals versus the blessings of God in 35 that have led to this fertile land with this highway. It's poetry. It's poetry that's, uh, as Oswald, to quote uh, the, the uh, theologian again, says, speaks to the effective side of our personality. Its power is to shape our thinking and motivate us to action. It's inappropriate to reduce the imagery to simple, literal statements. That is, we shouldn't get lost in the details. We should let the poem wash over us, uh, hear the contrasts, and feel the weight of the whole. That, that before each and every one of us and before the people of God in Isaiah's day, there is a choice. That there are two types of people, the nations or Edom, a symbol and a type of all those who are opposed to God, who choose to trust in themselves or in other humans. And we read in uh, 34 that uh, they will be punished and they will end up in a wasteland. The, peop- the, the Edom stands for these people who, who ha- have an arrogant trust in man and themselves over God. Versus Israel or the redeemed, the people of God. Those who trust in him, who will see not a wasteland but joy. A desert come to life. They will, they will be the people who trust God and not, not arrogantly in themselves but humbly bowing the knee before God. Trust in the nations results in a desert. Trust in God results in a garden. And so as we consider these two chapters which put before us these two choices of, of trust, 
of where our trust is placed, then I want you to consider today where do you fit? Are you Edom of chapter 34 or the Israel of chapter 35? Where is your trust placed? In man or in God? Sometimes it can be hard to figure that out, where your trust is placed. But very helpfully for me, someone once told me, if you're struggling to think, figure out where your trust is placed, maybe try and figure out what you're most afraid of. Because what you fear most reveals where your trust is, doesn't it? See, if you fear most of all not having enough money to support your family that might reveal that your trust is in money. If you fear having a bad reputation, that might reveal that your trust is in what people think of you. I don't know what it is that you fear most. What is it that uh, wakes you up in the middle of the night screaming because you've uh, woken up naked before all your school friends? Or whatever whatever that dream is that uh, 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 makes you kind of sweat at night because it's sort of so fear-inducing. That's an invitation to think about where your trust lies. And of course, in 2020, I think we have a new test as well, not just what do we fear, but are we uh, placing undue hope in the flip of a calendar. So, I I, I don't know if you notice this, but there is a lot of hope in our world at the moment being placed in the flip of a calendar. That is, that in 28 days or however many we've got to go till New Year's Day, uh, that somehow everything's going to get better. Like, oh, 2020. What a write-off, and like, I'm 100% there, what a year. But who says 2021 is going to be any better? We've already had bushfires. Fraser Island has been burning. Tasmania has had lots of rain and is apparently heading for an extremely hot summer. Yes, there's the word of vaccine, but there's also the potential for, for a different virus. Not to mention the geopolitical landscape. Uh, you, you'll know that uh, I'm in the Army Reserves, and let me tell you, I get scared there sometimes when I hear these commanders talk about the reality of our world. So, 2021, or 2022, or 2023 could be worse than 2020. And if your hope is on some sort of magical reset occurring simply because we flipped the calendar, then the question is, why? What is your trust in? Because it's simply another day. And the joy of the redeemed does not come from the flip in the calendar, but from God bringing life. And so that brings us to the question, well, when does this beautiful picture of this desert turn to life occur? When does Isaiah 35 happen? For it's a prophecy to the people of God, uh, inviting them to trust God so that they will see this future, this beautiful future. But when? When will the desert bloom? When will the lame walk? When will the redeemed only have joy? Well, there are a few options that scholars kick around. Some think that perhaps Isaiah was speaking of when the exiles would return from Babylon. We've been, we, we, we looked at Daniel recently. We know that God's people were living there. And when they came back, maybe that was going to be what, this, what, what Isaiah was talking about here, where they returned to the promised land. But of course, if we read uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, which tell the story of the 
the people of God coming back from the promised land, we, we know that, that Isaiah 35 fails the test of corresponding to their reality because it was a, not a beautiful place they returned to. The, the, the Jerusalem was in ruins. They had to rebuild the walls. The language is far too exalted to be about uh, the exiles returning from Babylon. And so I think we're then left to say, well, it must be pointing us to something else. And in fact, it must be pointing us to Jesus. And in fact, if we look to Luke chapter 7, verses 18 to 23, we actually see that Jesus appeals to this very passage when he describes his ministry. I'll read to you from verse 18 of Luke 7. John's disciples told him uh, about all these things, calling him that... Uh, calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord to ask, are you the one who was to come or should we expect someone else? When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to ask, are you the one who was to come or should we expect someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses and evil spirits and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. It sounds a little bit about, like what the prophet here in Isaiah is promising, doesn't it? Let me read you again from verses 5 and 6 of chapter 35 of Isaiah. Then will the eyes of the blind be open and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The prophet Isaiah here is speaking of the coming of the Messiah and the blessing of God that he will bring. He's pointing us in part to that first Christmas day and that's why when we uh, when we talk about Christmas and we uh, li- get ready for Christmas, we talk about things like hope and joy. For it is the Messiah who brings the kingdom of God to earth, who makes the blind see and the lame walk, who restores us to right relationship with God uh, and who enables us to experience in our, in our lives with him the, the, the flourishing life that this poem goes on to experience uh, uh, and describe. But yet, you and I live some 2,000 years after the first Christmas and as we reflect on this passage, we can't help but notice that the Messiah has come and they're still blind, lame and mute people. It's great that Jesus was healing some when he came to earth, but what about now? Is the wilderness still dry? Isn't creation still groaning, we might ask? Jesus has come and he, he, he brought with him some of the joy of Isaiah 35 and made it real to us. And yet there is more to come. And that's because we have in Isaiah 35 not just a, a looking forward to the coming of Christ at Christmas, but of his second coming too that through Jesus, uh, sorry, that though Jesus began the work of bringing the kingdom to God to bear on earth in his earthly, earthly ministry, and though we experience that in our own lives by the Holy Spirit today, we still await its total fulfilment. The Apostle John, who hung out with Jesus who experienced all the miracles, he saw the, the, the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear, He saw all that and yet he also knew the reality of sin. He also knew the reality of chapter 34, the pain of of human trust in themselves instead of God. And so he wrote to his his fellow brothers and sisters, fellow Christians in 1 John uh, and he said this, Dear friends, Uh, 1 John 3, 2. Dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known but we know that when Christ appears we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. We can't know for certain how it's all going to work out but just as the, uh, the first Christians who spent time with 
the, the, the Messiah when he came, Jesus Christ, we can know that to walk with God is to walk in security, blessing and joy and that when he returns, we shall be like him. We can know that even if we only experience some of the joy of the redeemed described in chapter 35 in a limited way in the here and now, there will come a day when joy is unlimited. We are on the highway of holiness and we will enter Zion with joy. We can be sure of that. Christ has come. He will come again. And that is good news. And as we hear this prophecy, as we await Christ's return, we ought to do what Isaiah said in chapter 35. He encourages the people of God who didn't yet experience the the fullness of what he described in chapter 35, to to take heart, to trust in God. Let me read again from verses 3 and 4. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way, say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear, your God will come, he will come with vengeance, with divine retribution, he will come to save you. Strengthen yourself. Do not be afraid, God is coming. He has come to save us through Jesus Christ and he will come again to bring all his promises to fulfilment. God has not abandoned us. He will not be defeated. And if we trust Jesus, we will walk on the highway of holiness into perfect eternity with him forever. So let's be people of joyful hope. We know how the story ends. We know that God wins. We know that Jesus has come to live and to die for us. And so we ought to be a people who have a joy that transcends our experience. In 1 Peter, the apostle writes... Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. You see, the joy of the redeemed can be for us today because we know what God has done for us and we know what he will do. As we prepare for Christmas, it's easy to find joy in the wrong places in the singing of Christmas carols, in lights on a tree, in family and friends, in delicious food. And all of those things are wonderful blessings indeed, but it's not those things that bring us joy. Deep, inexpressible, glorious joy comes because of who God is and what he has done and it can transcend even the deepest of darkest circumstances. So as we seek to be people of joy, filled with the spirit of joy, we can also seek to be people who bring some of the renewal that this passage speaks about too. As we remember what God has done, as we are filled with joy, we can seek to bring joy to others. That was what Paul did in his ministry 2 Corinthians 1.24, not that we lord it over, you, over your faith, but we work with you for your joy because it is by faith you stand firm. Paul's ministry was to work for their joy, which came through their faith. And so to our work is to spread the joy of the gospel, partnering with God who brings new life. I wonder if people think of you as a person who brings joy, not just in the way that you live life, but in the message of hope that you bring with you. Well, as we finish, let me pray, as Paul prays in Romans 15, that we be filled with all joy and peace.
Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have promised to restore our world. You have promised to restore our lives. And we pray that as we take this time before Christmas to reflect on your coming and your second coming, that you would fill us with all joy and peace, that you would grow us in our trust in you, and that you may uh, fill us to overflowing with, the, with hope by the power of your Spirit. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.